I remember he stopped sleeping. That was kind of the, that was the first sign that, that something was off. The first time he had a panic attack, I, I thought he was having a heart attack. You know, I didn't know what was happening. He started shaking. He couldn't think, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't drive. Matt was really ill. By October, he was full-blown manic psychosis. We knew it was stress-related, and you know, we now know that stress is one of the main triggers for bipolar disorder. We spent a year kind of going in and out of treatment programs. Nothing was really working. We hospitalized him again in December. He was there for two weeks, he got released. He stopped taking his meds. It took three and a half years to find the right doctor. And then we got like our big break. Somebody who knew my husband said, I went on a ketogenic diet, I kicked my addiction, I got over my obesity, and I cured my bipolar disorder. And I was like, by May, when it started to work for Matt, I said, oh my God, this, it, we can't, we have to share this. We have to start funding science right now. The usual paradigm in medicine has been that you, know, you start with a drug, and if that doesn't work, you add another drug or many more drugs. I think it'd be better for us as a community to look at the brain more holistically and say, this is an organ that we need to understand better to prevent disease or treat disease. One of the biggest misconceptions in medicine is that brain is separate from the body, it is not. Everything is physiological. Metabolic health is looking at any kind of metabolic abnormality that gives us a sign that there's some dysfunction in the body. If you don't have an ideal or optimal metabolic health, the chances of you having other disease or more complications or treatment resistant forms of disease is higher. Metabolic psychiatry is looking at improving metabolic dysfunction to improve mental health. Bipolar disorder and other major psychiatric illnesses are likely actually a systemic illness and that the brain is one part of that systemic illness. The regulation of how energy flows through the organism, through neurons and other cells and through the brain is fundamental to how the brain works and how we work, how we perceive the world. In schizophrenia, in bipolar disease, there is a problem with the way the brain utilizes glucose and other aspects of the metabolic machinery, then circumventing that and providing another source of energy, we might be able to normalize the abnormal cell biology, therefore the symptoms. Ketogenic diet is a diet low in carbohydrates, moderate in protein, and high in fat. When your body is burning fat as a fuel source, you will have ketone bodies. That ends up having tremendous effects on your metabolism and brain function. It's a metabolic therapy that we know works through a number of pathways that can balance the neurotransmitter systems in the brain, balance the energy levels in the brain, reduce systemic inflammation, which reduces neuroinflammation. We know inflammation in the brain can trigger psychiatric disorders. We've known for over 100 years that ketogenic diets improve, stabilize, protect, energize the brain. The science is already here. This is an evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. We have two Cochrane reviews, which are the gold standard meta-analyses in the medical field. Could a dietary intervention that's metabolism-based, could it actually affect the processes in the brain that produce the disease to begin with? In which case, if it turns it around, then are you curing the disease or modifying the disease such that you don't really need to have other therapies for symptom relief? I think I was ready. I was handling a lot of the other elements of the wellness program that need to be taken care of. Exercise, getting sleep, et cetera, not smoking. I'd quit smoking. When my mom Jan came to me and said, look Matt, there's this diet that could be helpful for your illness, the keto diet, I was fully on board. In order to convince the field that this is something you should seriously consider you know, prescribing for your patient, we have to be able to tell them how it works. I think it's really important to be systematic and meticulous about answering very fundamental questions because those will provide the foundation upon which our treatment modalities will be understood. We started our philanthropy several years ago. We're funding individual components and building the system to connect it all. I hope we're a catalyst for a lot of other funders. We need a lot of different voices and different patients and different communities coming together. Clinicians who are treating patients with ketogenic diet, basic scientists. We need to embrace 
the entrepreneurial world, we need to give patients a voice and put that forward and, and let them be part of the advocacy. Enabling them and empowering them to take control of their health. We need to reconsider how we think of mental illness as metabolic brain dysfunctions that are reversible and treatable. The more we learn about core drivers and core solutions, and the more that gets out into the public, we're naturally gonna have a dissolving of stigma. In 2017, the World Health Organization estimated there were one billion people on the planet suffering from a mental disorder. A lot of people are suffering. We wanna just get the ball rolling to let people know there might be a better way. We have an obligation and we have the resources to make a huge change. I mean, to literally impact hundreds of millions of people's lives. We need to build a movement. So this is a bit of a story with four constituents. The first constituent is my son, Matthew, who you're going to meet tonight, who's the courageous one and who's battled bipolar for over five years and has just made enormous progress and is in such a good state right now that we're so proud of him. The second constituent who I'm going to introduce shortly is my wife, Jan Ellison Bazuki, who is the tenacious one and the creative one and the one who for years and years researched on her own, tapped into many of your networks, and ultimately brought us to where we are today in metabolic health, metabolic psychiatry, and a huge cure for my son. The third component is me. Um, you know, CEO of Roblox, have learned a little about innovation and have fortuitously in the last year gone public. So we have this wonderful opportunity, and I, I sometimes think of it as a philanthropic greenfield because this is a huge opportunity. And it's very hard in philanthropy to find one big area to deploy the fruits of one's labor, if you will. And this is exciting to me because it's potentially, potentially something like that. And then it's a story of all of you, innovators, visionaries. I'm familiar with it, what it's like to be an innovator and a visionary. Sometimes it's scary. It's very hard. Um, we're working on problems that are really big, that are not short-term tactical solutions, but giant strategic solutions. And if they work, you get that funny feeling in your stomach that this might be 10 times bigger than we think. Um, it might not work out, but it might be 10 times bigger than we think. And that's the excitement about taking the long view and solving hard problems and doing innovation. So we have four wonderful constituents um, that'll be here tonight. And with that, I'm happy to introduce my wife, Jan Ellison Bazuki. Welcome. He has a lot more practice at speaking than I do. <laughs> so I'm going to stand behind the podium. Thank you all for being here. When we hatched this plan, it wasn't that long ago, a few months ago, I said to Kara, but it's not that much notice. Is anyone going to come? And she said, they're going to come and look, look, like you all came. <laughs> this is incredible. So, wow, thank you. And then I started to have some imposter syndrome, and I was like, I have to stand up and talk to people who have dedicated their lives to medicine and neuroscience and psychiatry and uh, entrepreneurship and uh, you know, what is my qualification for standing here? So I did what one does in those moments. I called my therapist. <laughs> and she reminded me that I have this one very important qualification, which I share with my husband, which is that we traveled with Matt on his mental illness journey. And we watched him go into it, and we watched him come out the other side. And watching him come out the other side and having some idea of why that was, of the interventions that made his recovery possible, enables me to stand here today and have something to offer you all, which is really his story. So I'll share a bit about that story. It started on March 13, 2016 at 3.30 p.m. when he sent me a text. He was a freshman at UC Berkeley. He's the eldest of our four children. We also have three daughters. So we'd gone off to college that fall. He had not, we had known he was not doing well, but we didn't know the extent of it until I got this text. 
Going through a profound enlightenment, can't think straight. I know these texts seem weird because they are coming straight from my body. And then I knew that something was very terribly wrong because this was a kid who, when he was in third grade, said, I'm a boy who goes to church, but I don't believe in God. He was a rationalist. He was you know, not into spiritual things. And suddenly something had changed in his brain. And that began our journey, what Peter, Peter Early, who wrote a book about his own son's journey in bipolar disorder, calls a journey through America's mental health madness. And that became the day that we were the family that people needed to bring casseroles to, but of course nobody brought casseroles because you don't talk about a bipolar diagnosis. He spent 10 days in the psychiatric hospital at Stanford. He was 51 50 He was released on 20 milligrams of Zyprexa, which is a second-generation antipsychotic and a diagnosis of bipolar one with psychotic features. And that, um, it was supposed to be a manic episode. We knew it was a manic episode right when we got that text. I basically Googled his symptoms and I could tell that what was happening. And the bipolar one diagnosis, we accepted, but his psychiatrist, who was a Stanford trained psychiatrist, kind of decided that it might have been just a one time psychotic break, which we were super happy to hear. Maybe our son does not have a lifelong mental illness. Maybe he just had a psychotic break. And it could have been this, could have been that. And maybe he's okay. His doctor tapered him off of olanzapine and basically went to back to college in the fall, pretty much unmedicated. By October, he was in another full blown manic psychosis. We brought him home. He was hospitalized at El Camino for two weeks. He was released. Every time he was released, he started smoking cigarettes again. It took me months of Googling before I finally figured out that smoking cigarettes can interfere with Zyprexa blood levels, some say up to 80%. So every time he started smoking, when he got out of the hospital, he got manic again, and then he had to go back in the hospital. And this went on. Um, he was hospitalized that December for two weeks. It got out. He was hospitalized again on New Year's Eve. And then finally, we decided it's not working to have him at home series of residential treatment programs all around the country. And the pattern was he would get better for a little while, then he would get released, then he would feel bad, then he would go off his medication, then he would get hospitalized again. It's a pattern that I know many of you in this room are familiar with. Once he was at a young adult transition program in Bend, Oregon, he was there for 10 days and one morning, early in the morning, he left his phone and his backpack behind. He left a note saying he was go off to study Latin. He took his Latin textbooks, left them behind and hitchhiked out of Bend, Oregon. He, he managed to catch three rides, which he's 6'4", guy, like has a big beard. I was surprised that he managed to catch three rides. <laughs> Caught three rides out of Bend, Oregon. The last one was with a drunk driver. They crossed the border into California, got as far as Susanville, and were pulled over in a high-speed chase. The driver was arrested, and Matt had no money, no wallet, no phone, and so the cops gave him 10 bucks, which he used for food, till we got there to pick him up that late that night. And that began another series of treatment programs. We, we resolved that he couldn't be living at home unless he was med compliant and sober, which he was not. And so he went to live with his grandparents in Carmel. That went okay for a couple of months and then he got in an argument with his uncle and he set out on foot at midnight, one night in December. Spent two weeks roaming California, slept behind a dumpster, slept in a lifeguard tower till he stopped sleeping at all. He once recorded himself flushing his lithium down the toilet on a Greyhound bus and posted that on Snapchat. And then we were able to locate him. Dave got on a plane, flew down, rented a car, and found him at a Starbucks. He had given away most of his belongings. He'd lost 20 pounds. He was barefoot, and he was holding, his, uh, he was holding a shopping bag with his phone and his computer, which he had managed to hang on to for those two weeks. We got him hospitalized again in San Diego, and he was there two weeks. The fact that he had shared this journey on the internet was, of course, terrible at the time. But it turned out to be a blessing because once he was medicated again and he came out of his psychosis, he looked at those videos and he said, I never ever want to be manic again. What do I need to do? That was almost four years ago. And even though he started doing everything he needed to do, everything, he did not get well. He got better, but he did not get well. He meditated daily. We got him a new psychiatrist, Dr. Po Wong at Stanford, who's treating him now. He got a new therapist, he did DBT, he did CBT, he quit drinking, he quit smoking, he quit alcohol, he quit marijuana. He exercised daily, he managed his sleep, he wore blue light blocking gases, and he still was not well. I dragged him through several sessions of RTMS, the SAINT protocol at Stanford, neuromodulation protocol, which some of you may be familiar with, and which worked great for bringing him out of a brief depression, but it didn't do anything to stabilize his mood. Nothing stabilized 
his mood. And by now we were five years in and Dr. Wong declared that he had treatment resistant bipolar one. And when you get a declaration of treatment resistant mental illness, what are you supposed to do with that? You know, you're supposed to accept it, which is what everyone told me to do. And I was like, nope, not gonna go the acceptance route. <laughs> like, let's keep looking. By then, he'd been treated by 41 mental health professionals, prescribed 29 medications, nine antipsychotics, included plus lithium, and he was still not well. He was in college, but his cognitive function was impaired, his moods were erratic, his relationships were difficult. Every day was a struggle just to manage his own mind through the day. And then in fall of 2020, right in the heart of COVID, we got our big break. And the big break was that somebody knew somebody who knew that we were investing in mental health startups and they connected us to Stephen Hayes, who runs a mental health startup syndicate. And he told us his story and his story was that he met a doctor, I think it was Dr. Chris Palmer, who is in the room with us today, who helped him get on a ketogenic diet. He addressed his addiction issues, his obesity issues, and his bipolar issues. Within a year, he was able to start his own company. That night, I read Chris's website, and I read all the links from papers that many of you here in this room wrote. And I felt like, okay, we're really onto something. But for six years, I had been saying, we're really onto something. And I didn't want to tell Matt because I didn't want to drag him through yet another thing and have, you have to give up yet another thing, in this case, sweets and carbohydrates and Coke, and then have it go nowhere. But now I can never keep my mouth shut. So, <laughs> of course, I blurted it out next time I saw him. I was like, this guy told me about this keto diet and it's going to make you better from bipolar, expecting him to say, yeah, yeah, mom as he had said with most of my dietary ideas over the last five years. And he said, when can I start? I want to do keto. And then it was like, okay, game on. We're going to do this thing. Reached out to Dr. Palmer. He didn't have any room in his private practice, but of course he agreed to treat Matt pro bono just to help out. Introduced us to Denise, Denise Potter, who's also here in the room with us. We found out about Shabani Sethi's metabolic psychiatry clinic at Stanford, started reading everything I could read and talking to everyone. And last January, January 4th, Matt started on a ketogenic diet. And at first it was a little rocky. He had insomnia the first few days, which Dr. Palmer had prepared us for. He took a little extra Zyprexa, started sleeping through the night. He got COVID, he got sick, his ketones dropped, his low level symptoms, anxiety, irritability came roaring back. But Dr. Palmer said, and, and Denise said, you just gotta ride it out. When you get sick, people's ketones drop, we just gotta ride it out. And he wrote it out and he never cheated on that diet. Actually, he told me he cheated once, he dipped a piece of cheese in honey. That was his big cheat. <laughs> So he was completely committed, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing here today if that had not been the case. And within about a couple of months, in March, we call it March Madness, because those of you who treat bipolar patients, you know that many of them, when March hits, will become manic and be hospitalized. Dr. Wong tells us that he always plans his, his inpatient hours for March, March and September. And it had happened to Matt every year. I mean, he'd gone manic every March for year after year after year. And that March, he stayed on five milligrams of Zyprexa. He did not have to go up to 25. And he had zero symptoms, not even, not even a, a stitch of hypomania and certainly no mania and no depression to follow it. And so we really knew we were onto something by then. By May, I had been keeping a log of his symptoms and his medications for five years. And by May, I noticed I wasn't writing in the log because there was nothing to write because he was just living his life. He was getting up every day, he was going to classes, he was making friends, he was making music. He was living the life we didn't know he was ever going to live, which is just a regular life with a stable mood day after day after day. And so right around that time, Carolyn Wall Sakata, my partner in crime, came on board with the Bazooki Group to run our foundation. And we sort of pivoted our work in science to looking at this question of metabolic psychiatry and metabolic neuroscience. And we started to talk to many of you in the room. And we started to feel like we had to devote the rest of our lives to this cause, which is really understanding mental illness as metabolic brain dysfunctions that are not lifetime sentences, that do not mean you have to be on heavy doses of medication that give you metabolic illness for the rest of your life and that make you feel bad. These can be perceived as treatable and reversible conditions. And that's why we're here today. One of the people we met along the way was Jim Abrahams from the Charlie Foundation, whose son, I'm sure those of you who are staying on will, will hear about the Charlie Foundation. 
His son was cured of pediatric epilepsy on a ketogenic diet. After, I think, three weeks, he stopped having seizures, and that was after failing five medications and surgery. And I asked him, Carolyn and I met him on a Zoom, and I asked him, so the work that you do, which is furthering science and creating grassroots movements, which in their case included a movie that Meryl Streep starred in, I said, how much of your progress has been science and how much of your progress has been grassroots movement? And he said, 20% science, 80% grassroots movement. Now, they had a lot more science than we do, so let's, let's call it 50-50. We have a job ahead of us, and I think it's about 50-50, furthering the science that drives the treatments in metabolic psychiatry, doing the metabolic neuroscience, and the second is telling the stories. I know you all in this room have a story of when you said, oh my God, we're onto something. And I hope you will share those stories with each other and maybe up here on the stage and as you go forth in the world because it's those stories that are going to give rise to the rest of the evidence that we need to find and those stories that are going to seed this grassroots movement that we are going to begin today in this room and carry on the work that you've all been doing some for your entire lives and we're going to impact millions and millions of people around the world who struggle with mental illness. So thank you all for being here.